So for those of you that uh, joined us last week where we discussed uh, CRISPR uh, and had a quick introduction to it, welcome back. Uh, and for those of you that uh, didn't join us then, you'll find the recording of that webinar on our website. Uh, but also I'm just going to very quickly recap um, what we discussed in that webinar uh, at the beginning now. But really what I want to spend the, uh, the vast majority of the webinar today focusing on is the key considerations for uh, planning and executing a CRISPR genome editing experiment. And I'm going to be using mammalian cells as a, a model system, if you like, to describe what, how we would think about things at Horizon. Uh, but I would argue that, that some of the fundamental considerations uh, would apply no matter which system you're working in. And then finally, I'll, I'll just wrap up with a, a sort of teaser, if you like, for what we're going to be talking about next week. So just to remind you, this webinar is part of a series. And so next week, we'll be talking about the kind of things that you can achieve in cell lines, the kind of modifications you can make. OK, so just to recap from last week, uh, we are hugely fortunate as scientists to be working in this era of, uh, of, of genomic information, if you like. And last week, I made the case that um, genome editing is probably now the most robust uh, and biologically relevant way that you can explore the role that genes and mutations play uh, in disease. And you can do this by generating uh, isogenic cell pairs, for example, uh, so mutant and wild type cell lines. I introduced CRISPR-Cas9 as a genome editing tool, uh, and I argued that uh, its simplicity, both in design and use, the fact that you just require a 23 nucleotide target sequence in the genome to target, um, target your uh, particular gene of interest or site of interest. Uh, this simplicity is what makes, um, uh, is what allowed CRISPR to take genome editing from being quite a niche pursuit to the scientific mainstream. Uh, and finally, I described some of the things that you can do with CRISPR. Uh, so for example, if you want to make a knockout, uh, you can target it to the coding sequence of a gene. Uh, and rely on uh, repair of the double strand break it introduces by uh, error prone non homologous end joining to introduce frame shift mutations. Or if you introduce that double strand break uh, in the presence of a homologous donor sequence, uh, then in some cases you'll get repair via homology directed repair. And in this way, you can introduce exogenous sequence. And so uh, we now have this uh, relatively uh, cheap, uh, easy to use. Uh, and seemingly highly efficient genome editing system. Uh, and on the face of it, if we combine it with our cell line of interest, uh, and a few days later screen for targeted clones, uh, then after a couple of weeks, we should have engineered cell lines. And whilst this is the workflow, uh, very um, simplistically put, uh, there are another, a number of key considerations that one should bear in mind uh, as, as we go through the process. Uh, to maximize your chances of success. And so I want to spend uh, some time talking you through those now. Uh, so for the eagle-eyed amongst you, you'll notice I've changed uh, the actual wording of these just slightly from my slide last week, and that's just for clarity. Uh, but the, the essence remains the same. And so the, the seven key considerations, I would argue, are your choice of cell line, uh, your choice of gene target, uh, the uh, actual choice of the guide itself and where it's positioned. If you're doing a knock-in, how you go about designing the donor, uh, and then uh, what, uh, what the screening approach is, and ultimately how you validate your cell line. So let's get into it. So the first thing to keep in mind is that actually one of the biggest differentiators uh, for the success of a genome editing experiment in a cell line is actually the cell line itself. And what I mean by this is whether the cell line is amenable uh, to gene editing. So first of all, can you get the CRISPR reagents into the cell line? Can it be transfected? If not, can it be electroporated? If not, can it be virally transduced? And can this be done efficiently? Um, as this is going to really have a big impact on, uh, on the um, amount of work you've got to do to generate a targeted cell. Further to this, uh, if you want to be able to make things easy for yourself, then ideally you want to be able to enrich uh, the cells that have undergone potentially transfection and maybe even uh, those cells that have undergone uh, the gene targeting. And so you need to ask the question, is my, cell, uh, uh, is my cell amenable to this process? So for example, can I uh, put it through a cell sorter and enrich by fluorescence? Or can I uh, put it under um, antibiotic um, selection uh, and enrich 
in that manner. And the final thing is, if you want to derive a clonal targeted cell line, then you need to be able to single cell dilute your cell line. And not every cell uh, will lend itself to this process. So some are simply sticky. So no matter how much you triturate them, they will come down as clumps into your wells, uh, and you will be unable to derive single clones. And you can see an example of that in the top right-hand corner. And some simply don't like the process of being plated out at single cells per well. And actually, at Horizon, uh, we spend quite a lot of time um, testing uh, growth conditions to try and find the optimal ones uh, for single cell dilution. And so you can see in the bottom the kind of conditions we would test. And further to this, we'll also test out a range of different seeding densities uh, and then rely on the, on the dying back of the cells, if you like, uh, to identify um, the optimal growth conditions to, to um, derive clonal populations. So beyond the cell line, then within that cell line is, is the actual gene itself. Uh, and um, when I say the gene, what I mean is, first of all, uh, what is the, the status of the gene in that cell line? So what's the copy number? Um, if you, for example, uh, want to knock out your gene of interest, uh, then it's going to be a lot harder if it's been massively amplified in some way. So uh, you can see here uh, at the top a normal human karyotype, and underneath, uh, a HeLa carrier type, and you can see uh, the HeLa being a quite a genetically unstable cell line has undergone quite a lot of chromosomal rearrangements and amplifications. And so if, for example, you were trying to target uh, a, a gene in which there were, there were five copies, it would be much harder to, to knock it out. Um, further to this, it's worth being aware of the likely effect of your modification on the growth or the viability of the cells. So uh, at its most simplest, uh, if your gene is essential, then you're going to struggle to knock it out. Uh, but further to this, if uh, knocking in or knocking, or knocking out has an effect on the viability of the cells, why it, while it might ultimately be possible to derive a targeted cell, you're going to have to screen a lot more to, to find one that contains your desired modification. Now, critical for any CRISPR experiment is the design of the guide itself. And there are various tools out there uh, for designing and picking your guides. Uh, we have developed one in collaboration with a company called Desktop Genetics, uh, which you can find at this web address here uh, and on our website. Um, and what many of these tools allow you to do is not only identify the site itself, uh, but also to understand the likelihood of there being a site somewhere else in the enormity of the genome that shares significant homology. Uh, with your target site. So in other words, the likelihood of off-target cleavage. Now actually, uh, one of the things that you can do to improve um, the, the, your ability to select um, active uh, guides is to work with the sequence sourced from the cell line in which you want to target, as even single base changes can potentially have an impact on your guide activity if they're located within the, the target site. And further to that, uh, some of the tools, including, the, the, including our own, um, will uh, allow you to predict, uh, in silico at least, uh, the likely activity of your guides. And so you can use the scoring on off-target potential and the scoring on activity to, uh, to sort of balance how you want to, ba how, how you want to um, play uh, specificity versus efficiency, if you like. And then finally, uh, whether you're using the wild type system or the Nikkei system will influence the guides that you have to design. So whether you just design a single guide or a, a pair of guides. Now I did say that we can, to a certain extent, predict guide activity in silico. Um, but at this point, we would still recommend uh, designing multiple guides uh, for a, any targeting event and testing their activity up front. Uh, and the reason for this is that whilst uh, we generally find that most guides are um, active, there's always that uh, one or two um, that, for whatever reason, uh, lack activity uh, in the experimental system. And so the way we test activity at Horizon is using something called the surveyor assay. Uh, and the way in which the surveyor assay works is you have uh, a nuclease, um, which we call the surveyor nuclease, uh, which will cleave double-stranded DNA in which there are mismatches. And so, if you transfect your cells with your CRISPR reagents and your, your guide RNA, and after 72 hours harvest the DNA and amplify your target site, 
you can imagine if there's been a lot of cleavage going on in that pool uh, in that pool of cells, uh, then your your PCR product is as a consequence going to be quite heterogeneous. And so, what if you in incubate that PCR product with the surveyor nuclease, you're going to get cleavage of that product, and as a and you can use that cleavage as a proxy uh, for how much uh, disruption has actually gone on. Uh, in the cells itself by the Cas9 at the target site. And so here you can see uh, a gel in which we're, we're looking at the, the results of a surveyor assay. Uh, and so in lane three, we've got the, un, uh, the uncut PCR product. Uh, and then in lanes one to four, you can see guides uh, which were active in the system. And this is, indicati and this is indicated by uh, the lower molecular weight bands, uh, which uh, shows cutting by the surveyor. But in lane five, you can see that the only band that we really see uh, is the higher molecular weight band. And this tells us that this guide, for whatever reason, isn't active. And so had we picked this guide and progressed into our full-blown genome editing experiment, we'd have been screening a lot of clones uh, without finding any that were targeted. Now, beyond just picking an active uh, guide with a low off-target potential, uh, what you also need to do is pick one that's in the right position. And this will depend um, somewhat on the type of modification uh, that you want to make. So when people first started using CRISPR-Cas9 uh, for generating knockouts, uh, the accepted wisdom was to try to cite the guide in the first third of the coding sequence of the gene, such that you could uh, rely then on the frame shift mutation, uh, rendering that transcript non-functional downstream of that. Now, when you're doing this, it's worth being aware of any potential splice variants or alternative start codons uh, that may, as a consequence, override uh, the effects of this frame shift mutation. Uh, but further to this, uh, some recent publications have found, actually, that even along the length of genes, uh, that guides can be just as efficient at uh, knocking out the function of genes. And it's really only once you get towards the very C terminus of the protein does the efficacy of, of the guide in ablating the function of that gene uh, really drop off? And so you can see that here from a, a figure in, in Den Chetal's paper uh, looking across the length of, of four different genes. And so some recent evidence suggests that actually, uh, by designing your guide in the functional domain of a protein, um, this can actually significantly improve its likelihood of knocking out uh, functional forms of that gene. As even if uh, the mutation introduced is a non-frame shift mutation, so for example, uh, an insertion or a deletion that is a multiple of three, that just having that mutation there in the functional domain uh, can render that protein non-functional. So that's something to keep in mind. In terms of knock-ins, the accepted wisdom remains that you should want to position your cut site in as close a proximity as possible uh, to the site at which you want to make your modification. And in terms of uh, the Nikkei system, uh, there are some subtleties that are specific to that system. And so there is an excellent paper uh, that came out last year in Cell in 2014 uh, that uh, looked at the various parameters around designing a Nikkei experiment. Uh, and this figure, for example, shows that if you're using the D10A Nikkei, uh, that the best uh, combination or, or pair uh, parameters, if you like, are having a five prime overhang, and that you want to keep your, your offset between that pair as low as possible. And, and that's shown here uh, across three different genes in which you can see that the, as the offset increases, uh, the targeting efficiency goes down. And actually, once you get to a three prime overhang, uh, there's no targeting efficiency at all. Uh, and so, like I say, the guide positioning will depend on what modification you're trying to make. And I've tried to summarize that here. Now, if you're planning a knockout, uh, then at this point, if you have an active guide uh, and an optimized uh, cell transfection protocol, then you could move forward to uh, targeting your cells uh, and looking to, to screen for, for knockout cell lines. Uh, but if you're planning a knock-in, it's actually at this point that I would advocate designing your donor sequence. Uh, and the reason for this is you want to design your donor in such a way that you minimize the chances of it being recut uh, once it's incorporated into the genome. 
And the way in which you can do this is knowing the guide sequence that you're going to be working with, uh, you can take elements of that guide sequence and introduce silent mutations in the donor uh, such that it can't then be recut. So a great way to do this, if you can, is to introduce the silent mutation into the PAM site, and if that's not possible, into the seed region, which is the region proximal to the PAM site. Now, of course, these are silent mutations, so you wouldn't expect them to interfere with uh, the protein sequence itself, but it's worth bearing in mind that they can still have an effect potentially on the expression or the splicing of your gene, and so uh, it's worth being conservative in terms of the, uh, the changes that you make. Um, also at this point, uh, you'll want to consider the, the, the type of donor that you want to use and its size. So if, for example, you're making a single nucleotide polymorphism, so just a single base change, then a single-stranded oligodonor is going to be sufficient. Uh, if, on the other hand, you want to introduce uh, a large uh, sequence, such as an epitope tag, uh, then you may be interested in using a plasmid instead, for example. And actually, at Horizon, uh, knock-ins have, for a long time, been uh, the lion's share of, of the projects that we've made up until uh, recently when we started accelerating our generation of knockout cells. Uh, and as a consequence, we spent quite a lot of time optimizing the parameters uh, for donor design. And the way in which we did this was to develop a testing platform, uh, what we called our fluorescent indicator of recombination, deficient, recombination efficiency, or our fire line. And the way in which this works is you have uh, a cell line into which we've knocked in an inactive GFP into one allele. And then you can then uh, use uh, various types of donors uh, with different uh, lengths, for example, or, or different selection strategies, uh, and look at their ability uh, to efficiently uh, correct the mutation in the GFP and restore fluorescence to those cell lines. And then it's very straightforward to just count uh, the number of fluorescent cells relative to non-fluorescent cells. And in this manner, you can quantify uh, the absolute targeting efficiency using that particular donor. And so in this manner, uh, we've been able to optimize our design parameters around single-stranded oligodonor design. Uh, and so uh, we've looked at various variables, uh, including length, uh, modifications, concentration, and purification. And I'll just share those results with you now. So uh, for example, we found that once we extended our donors much beyond 80 to 90 nucleotides, uh, we didn't really observe any appreciable benefit uh, in targeting efficiency. Uh, we also found that uh, uh, an optimal concentration was around about 20 picomolar of oligodonor. Uh, we found that HPLC purification gave us the best targeting efficiency. And finally, it was really only a three-prime three prime phosphorothioate modification that was required uh, to, impre uh, to, to retain a high level of targeting efficiency. And so I would just carry out these results by saying that this uh, is the optimal parameters for donor design in this test platform. But we do feel that it provides a nice data set for, uh, for starting with uh, for any donor design project although it may be that optimal parameters will vary from system to system. But in summary, uh, we would start with a 20 nucleotide single-stranded oligodonor with a 3 prime phosphothiorate modification, HPLC purified at 20 picomolars. Now, it's worth bearing in mind with any knock-in project that there's a range of potential outcomes, uh, especially if you're not enriching for transfected cells. And so I've got this pie, pie chart up just to illustrate that. It's certainly not going to be uh, an accurate reflection of, of what you'll see necessarily, but it, it gives you a feel for, for some of the potential outcomes. So for example, you're going to see amongst your clones cells which have not gone on, undergone any targeting at all. And then there will be those uh, that have, um, have been disrupted at the target sites, but that have not integrated um, the, uh, the oligodonor itself. And then in those cells that have undergone uh, the homology directed prepare with the donor, there will be some in which the donors integrated on one allele uh, and then a disruption event has occurred on the second allele. There will be some that are heterozygous for your knock-in and then 
probably uh, the the lowest the with the lowest frequency frequency will be a homozygous knock-in of your donor. And so it's really up to you to decide uh, what would be an appropriate outcome for your particular knock-in experiment. So if, for example, it's an absolute requirement uh, that you identify a homozygous knock-in, then you're going to have to screen more clones than if, for example, it was absolutely accept acceptable uh, to identify a clone in which uh, you had a knock-in on one allele and a disruption on the other. And this leads me nicely on to uh, the next consideration, which is the screening strategy itself. Now, at Horizon, uh, we really need a, an approach that's going to be appropriate for pretty much every um, genome ed editing experiment we do, uh, as we're doing so many each month. And so for this reason, uh, we would use PCR-based uh, screening strategies as our strategy of choice. And ideally, uh, what we would, we would be looking for is guides that cut uh, within the um, within restriction sites, uh, and then we can use restriction fragment length polymorphism uh, as a way to identify those clones that have undergone some kind of disruption event. And it is, uh, I should just say, uh, a way of screening for clones that have undergone disruption, uh, but as I'll discuss in a minute, we then need to validate what that is. Now, uh, what I would say is PCR works for us, uh, and we're set up to do a lot of PCR here, uh, but most labs aren't, or, or at least most labs will already have in their hands uh, optimized assays that may be more appropriate uh, for, for their screening protocols. So for example, if you have a, an optimized Western blot protocol, uh, maybe you're uh, set up for uh, immunofluorescence microscopy, uh, maybe flow cytometry if you're looking to knock out a cell surface protein, or even uh, ideally, you know, if your knock-in or knock-out confers some kind of drug sensitivity or, or, or resistance, or some kind of morphological change. All of these things can serve as potential markers uh, for clones that have undergone uh, targeting events. And now, for example, if we were doing a knock-in, uh, then we might also choose to incorporate uh, um, a marker for screening um, into that particular strategy. So here, for example, uh, is where we're in, uh, introducing a mutation into the EGFR gene in one of our HAP1 lines. Uh, in our HAP1 line, I should say, and as well as the, the mutation itself, we've also introduced a SP1 site. And so consequently, when we amplify the target site, uh, we can look for uh, cutting by SP1, uh, and we can take those clones forward for further characterization. And you can see here uh, that we have a targeting efficiency of approximately 8% in this particular experiment. Okay, so final step, and what I would really advocate as a, as a mandatory step almost uh, for anyone generating a targeted cell line is the process of actually confirming uh, what's actually occurred at the target site. And the reason for this is because if you're using NHEJ to generate a knockout, then it is a relatively random event. Uh, you would expect the mutations to be different on uh, each allele. And not all of them will be frame shift mutations, even if, they, even if every allele has been targeted. And so the way we would check uh, the nature of the mutations on multiple alleles would be to amplify the target site, subclone it into a topo vector, uh, use this to transform competent bacteria, uh, and subsequently sequence mini preps from those, from those clones to, uh, to deconvolute the alleles, if you like. Um, similarly, if you're generating a knock-in, then you'll want to know whether you've got a knock-in on both alleles, one allele, and what's happened on the uh, remaining allele. And so it's really worth going through this process to, to reassure yourself that uh, the, the, uh, the modification is as expected. It's also at this point uh, that you might wish to go back to your off-target predictions uh, and sequence at the most likely off-target sites. Uh, and see if there's been any evidence of, of modifications there. And it's well worth also checking uh, that the modification you've made has resulted in the desired effect. So if you've knocked out your gene, that it is indeed uh, knocked out at least at the protein level, uh, you may find out that uh, a frame shift mutation will not uh, disrupt RNA expression, uh, but it should still uh, ablate uh, functional protein expression. And similarly, if you made a knock-in, uh, you'll want to check that it's actually expressed. Uh, and finally, uh, as these cells are in culture for generally uh, quite a long period of time, anywhere from 8 to 16 weeks for genome editing uh, experiments, 
then it's well worth going through uh, some standard contamination testing at points of banking, testing for things like mycoplasma uh, and so on. Okay, so those are my seven key considerations for CRISPR genome editing. Uh, so just to summarize, uh, the first one is your choice of cell line. So is it suitable for genome editing? Can you get the CRISPR reagents in? Can you single cell dilute it? Uh, next, gene target. So is the gene essential? Is it expressed? Is it amplified? All of these things will impact uh, the efficiency of your gene targeting. Your choice of guide will, be, it will uh, be affected by how you want to balance specificity versus efficiency. And also, the position of the guide will be influenced by the kind of modification that you want to make. If you're planning a knock-in experiment, then you can modify your donor in such a way that you minimize the chances of being recut. And you can also, at this point, introduce uh, extra markers to allow you to screen for integration. And with regards to screening, um, hopefully, if you've <coughs> tested guide activity uh, and you have a feel for your transfection efficiency and you know what a desirable outcome would be, then you'll have, a uh, by the time you get to screening, a feel for how many clones you're going to have to screen to find a positive. And finally, uh, it's a very important to just validate at the genomic level that your engineering as, is as expected um, in, all, in all copies of the gene in the cell. Uh, 